No St. Caroline start out in prayer because she's very good at audible praying. So is Pastor Bob. So is Reverend Hanley. So is Peter. I pray, but I pray quietly. I pray silently. And perhaps that shows that God has a sense of humor because he has me doing a message on prayer. <laughs> show that all prayer, if done in a certain way, is good. It doesn't have to be audible. It doesn't have to be in the tongues. It doesn't have to be in a church. It doesn't have to be kneeling. Because prayer is communication. We talked last night and last week about communicating with God. And prayer is just that, a communication. We, the church, are supposed to be the bride of Christ. And if you're going to be the bride or the fiancé of someone, it's reasonable that you should communicate with them. If not, the marriage won't last very long. So if we're supposed to be the bride of Christ, we have to talk to them. And that's really all prayer is, is talk, is communication with God. And I think the Bible recognizes that people sometimes don't feel that they can pray. Because it says in Romans, for we know not what we should pray for as we might. But the Spirit makes, makes intercession for us and groanings that cannot be heard. In fact, if you are praying that actually you're praying with the Spirit because the Spirit is the one that tells you to pray. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the W5 of prayer. Also the manner of prayer, the mode of prayer, prayers that are not answered and prayers that some prayers that are answered and with luck we'll be out of here by 9.30. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding. Uh -huh. It says... The Bible says in Isaiah, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And that's repeated in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, we relate that to the fact that there were money changers in the temple. And that's true. But sometimes I think when we don't pray, we're actually robbing God of something. So it is a den of thieves if we're not praying. So the W5s of prayer. Who should pray? It's not just the preacher. It's not just the speaker. It's not just the elders. Everybody should pray. It's not limited to any one person. Who is everybody? When should you pray? He says, the Bible says that you are to pray without ceasing. James says, if you are sick, to pray. And if you are cheerful, to praise. So praise and prayer are essentially the same thing. They're both communicating with God. So when should you pray? All the time. Where should you pray? Anywhere. Anywhere, right. It doesn't have to be in church or a building or in your bedroom. It can be in the car, it can be while you're walking, it can be in the shower. It can be anywhere at all that you feel you're going to talk to God. So anywhere. What do you pray about? Everything at all. Because we are to talk to God about everything. It says in James that you do not get because you do not ask. And many people don't get what they need because they don't ask for it. They don't ask the way they should ask. Why should you pray? Because the Bible tells you to. It's a way of communicating with God. So the W5 of prayer. Who, when, where, what, and why? Just think about it. Something to think about. I knew I was going to get to dinner somehow. So it's a matter of praying. 
It says in Matthew, in like manner, pray thus. And he gives the Lord's Prayer. Now again, prayer is communication. If you're going to talk to your fiance or your spouse, you should address them. And many people think that saying, oh God, is a prayer. Well, it is in a sense. But if you use that all the time, it's like calling your wife woman. <laughs> or your husband man. I mean, it doesn't go very good for very long, at least. That's why the Bible says, in like manner, pray our Lord, who is in heaven. First you pray. First you address the person. Then you say praise. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. But the wish for your kingdom to come. It's a matter of praying in a sense that you give honor to the Father. It's not just what you want. Oh God, give me this. That really doesn't go very far. See, there are prayers that are not answered because they're not done with the proper amount of three things. First, you need to have faith. It says if you must approach God, you must first believe that he is. If you don't believe in him, there's not much sense in praying to him. So you first much preach. You must first believe that he is. You must have faith. Secondly, you must be humble. You cannot pray prayer, pray and expect a prayer to be answered properly if you do it without being humble. And I'll get examples to show you about this later on. And the third is you must be sincere. If you are sincere and humble and have faith, then the prayer will probably be answered. It's acceptable regardless of how you pray, whether you pray silently, whether you pray out loud, whether you pray in church, whether you pray in tongues, regardless. Because God hears all prayers. He may not answer all prayers, but he does hear them all. And then, of course, what you wish for, what you request, and that should be something that you really need, yes. not just something that you want. I don't know many people who pray and win the lottery because of prayer, <laughs> but many people pray to win it. Yeah. But that's not your need, that's your creed. Mm -hmm. yes. If you really need something and pray for it, often your prayer will be answered, and often it's because you have to be totally humble, yes. which means many times you're at the very end of your string before it's answered. Often it's at the very last bit of your strength, your vestige of your hope that it comes through. And this is because many times people aren't humble beforehand. So you pray to someone by addressing them, praising. When Jesus was giving, was blessing the five loaves and fish, the first thing he did was lift to heaven and give thanks. Yes. Giving thanks is the same way as praising. Yes. And it's important, if he has to do it, we have to do it. Yes. It's most important. So, the manner of prayer is one in which we should address the person, God, Jesus. Give thanks, some praise, before you ask for something. And it's something that is done, sometimes not enough. Then there's the mode of prayer. There's the mode of prayer because there are different ways that people pray. Some people pray in private. And some people pray in public. Now we were asked in a Bible study, is it okay to pray in public? Of course it is. See, 
In Matthew 6, Jesus talks about the Pharisee who stands in the corner and prays loudly, telling the world, everyone in earshot, how great he was because of what he did. It wasn't the public prayer that Christ was criticizing, it was the manner in which it was done. But he said, go into your own closet, go into your own room and pray quietly to your Father who is in heaven, and he will hear you. There's nothing wrong with public praying as long as it's done with a proper attitude and in a proper way. There's nothing wrong with going into your private closet, the war room as some people call it, and praying there. They both work. Some people pray very loudly. Others pray quietly or silently. Is there anything wrong with praying loudly? No. However, the Bible nowhere states that God has a hearing problem. Yes. So you don't have to pray loudly for it to be heard. He knows your thoughts even before you speak them. Yes. Any kind of prayer done in the proper way is effective. Some people speak very long prayers. Some are very short. The prayer of Jabez in 1 Chronicles really says, O oh Lord, bless me in exchange, enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and that you would keep and keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. Very short. Most prayers in the Bible are short. Is there anything wrong with a long prayer? No. But God's a pretty quick learner. He can get it pretty quickly. You don't need to pray a long prayer for it to be effective. And then there's the prayer of repetition. God says do not do vain repetitions as the heathens do but go and speak to your Father who will hear and understand you. Does that mean it's wrong to repeat a prayer? There's a difference. That's right. You don't need to repeat things in a constant manner. God gets it the first time. But to repeat a prayer over time, if it's not apparently being answered, and keep repeating it, and keep praying, mm -hmm. is effective. And it does work. Because yes. sometimes you need to keep repeating a prayer in order to show your sincerity. Mm -hmm. In order to show you really need, mean what you're saying. Amen. Amen. So a prayer can be almost any context you want as long as it's done with faith, with humbleness, and with sincerity. There are no real limits other than that. The, poor, the robber on the cross said just to bless him, to be remember him. Yes. And God said, you will be with me. And that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. It's a sincerity that comes, by, comes from that. Yeah. So I want to give you some examples of answered prayer not from the Bible, but from our modern times. Now we've had examples of answered prayer tonight. Yes. Thank you. And it's, it is said that God does major answers to prayer infrequently, but personal answers are very common. And we've seen some personal answers. But I want to show you some other ones that are dramatic. Now the trouble is that people who don't want to believe We'll put some of this down to sheer circumstance, or coincidence, or it just happened. So it depends on how you look at it. But some of these are hard to explain by mere coincidence. And if you really have faith, you'll accept them as answers to prayer. The first I want to mention is something which is very famous, and it took place back in 1634 time when the bubonic plague was ravaging Europe. 
It was the greatest plague, pestilence that has ever uh, come across the world as far as we know. Two out of every three people in Europe died from this. Over 60 million people. Whole villages were wiped out. It took 150 years for Europe to recover from this plague. It was not something that was very well accepted. And it was spread by rodents and by fleas. There's a little town in Germany called Obergemera who had escaped this plague for a few years, but eventually someone coming home for Christmas took the plague with them. And like every other town, they were being devastated. It is said that almost every family in the town experienced a death. So they did something which no other town apparently did because they got together and they prayed that if God would spare the town, they would do something to honor him about and his son, about the son's death. And it is said that from that day on, no one died in that town from the plague. Everyone else survived, and those who were sick with it actually recovered. And you think there were no antibiotics, there's no treatment for this. Towns were being wiped out completely. Everybody did in them. But from the time they prayed, no one died in that town from the plague. And they have kept their promise. Every 10 years, the Passion Plain over Gamera takes place. Every 10 years from 1634 to the present. Almost everybody in the town takes part, over 2,000 people. You have to be a member, a resident of the town for at least 20 years, or born there, to take part in this. The last one, 2010, there were over 2,000 residents took part in this play. It goes from May to October, and it occupies the entire town for the summer. We were privileged enough to see it in 2010. But it is, a comp it is a promise that they made to God, and they've kept it. The only exception being in 1940, when the Second World War was on, they could not do it. Other than that, they have kept their word to honor God with their performances. And it is quite a performance. So that's one, that's one example of answered prayer. The second, 1746, French were having, were organizing an armada to attack North America. Duke Danville was, was the head of this armada of over 70 ships, 600 cannon, 13,000 troops. They were going to attack Lewisburg, Annapolis Royal, the English colonies along the Atlantic seaboard, and then the British West Indies. This was a formidable force, a force that no one in the Western Hemisphere at that time could withstand. This was a major, major offensive. The people in New England knew very well that they could not withstand this assault. So the governor of New England, of Massachusetts actually, William Shirley, he ordered October 10th, 17, 1746, to be a day, a day of prayer and fasting. That day was sunny and bright. A nice day. 
at the old South Meeting House in Boston at that particular time, our Reverend Thomas Price started to pray. And he prayed that there would be some form of a way to deliver them from their enemies. That God would send a storm to drive the enemy back. Before he stopped speaking, a wind came up, the sky darkened, and it blew so hard it rattled the windows and shook the steeple of the church. Wow. <laughs> the force from France was delayed by a storm, delayed for a month by the storm, to the point that many of the sailors and soldiers became sick, the ships became scattered, the assault did not happen. Did not happen in Annapolis Royal, did not happen in Lewisburg, and did not happen in New England. The ships were grounded. The ones that were not damaged by the storm were taken over by English boats and sunk. The Duke Danville himself died and was buried on George's Island in Halifax Harbor. Later moved to Lewisburg. Was it a coincidence? Or was it a prayer result? If you have faith, you'll think it was prayer. prayer. If you don't, you may think it's just a coincidence. The third refers to a little girl. Annie and Verona Clayton. They were poor. They were out trying to find some wood for their house. Annie was five, Verona was seven. They went out to find some wood when the older girl became sick. She became very sick, there was cholera in the area, and she became so sick she couldn't walk. The basket they hit was filled, and they were returning home, but this girl became so much, become, uh, became in so great a pain that she couldn't proceed any further. There was no one on the street. Everything was quiet. They didn't know what to do. They didn't want to go to a workshop. They sat for a while while the pains got worse. Remember the elder girl said, you know, Annie, it's a good while ago, mother told us that if we ever get into trouble, we should pray and God would help us. Now you help me get up on my knees and hold me up and we will pray. There they did. They asked God to send someone to help them home. Certainly, shortly after that, Anne saw way down the street a man come out, look around, up and down the street and go back into the factory. Bernie said, perhaps he is not the one God is going to send. If he is, he will come back. And he did. A second time he walked and looking, looking back and forth and then went back in again. That may not be the one whom God will send us, said Bernie. If he is, he will be come out again. He came out a third time and came this way, saw them, and walked over to them. A brawny German in broken accent asked of children, what is the matter? Well, sir, said Annie, sister here is so sick she cannot walk and we cannot get home. Never mind, I'll take you home, said the man. So the strong man gathered the sick child up and with her head pillowed upon her shoulder, carried her to the place 
or through hosts. He said to the mother, or the child said to the mother, there was a man there with the children. And the astonished mother, with a mixture of surprise, took charge of the precious burden and the dead child was laid upon a bed. After thanking the man, he stood there waiting and thought she thought that he wanted some payment. And he said, no. God pays me. I would like to tell you there's something. I am the proprietor of an ink factory. My men work by the piece. I have to keep separate accounts with each. I pay them every Saturday. At 12 o'clock, they will be at my desk for their money. This week, I've had many hindrances and must be aligned with my books. I was working hard at them with a sweat on my face in my great anxiety to be ready on time. Suddenly, I could not see the figures. The words in the book all ran together and had a plain impression, had a plain impression on my mind that someone in the street wished to see me. I went out, looked up and down the street, but seeing no one, went back to my desk and wrote a little. Then the darkness was greater than before and the impression stronger than before that someone in the street needed me. Again I went out, looked up and down the street, walked a little way, puzzled to know what I meant. Was my hard work and were the cares of business driving me out of my wits? Unable to solve the mystery, I turned again into my shop and to my desk. This time my fingers refused to grasp the pen. I found myself unable to write a word or make a figure, but the impression was stronger than ever on my mind that someone needed my help. A voice seemed to say, why don't you go out as I tell you there is need of your help? This time I took my hat and going out resolved to stay until I found out whether I was losing my senses or there was a duty for me to do. I walked some distance without seeing anyone and was more and more puzzled until I came upon the children and found that there was indeed need of my help. I can understand it. The younger girl had the courage to say, Oh, mother, we pray. Was it a coincidence? Or was it the answer to prayer? You see, even a simple prayer sometimes is all you need. The fourth, maybe maybe you've heard of this man, George Mueller. George Mueller was a son born in Prussia. He was not a nice man in his early life. He was someone his father sent to a college, to the cathedral school so he could become a priest and earn a good living. The idea was not to necessarily spread God's word, but was to earn a good living. He went there, spent more time spending money and carousing around and doing anything else. He left there Went to another school, did the same thing, spent a lot of money. He got involved with drugs. He got involved with alcohol. He went to a different school, different cathedral university school. Still had the same problem. He became a preacher, but really didn't pay any attention to what he was preaching. He didn't really care what he was preaching about. He was more interested in the money and the good times than anything else. He really was not involved in anything Christian or religious. 
he was actually arrested a number of times for stealing and was in prison. And this happened until he went to a, another type of service where people accepted him just as a person, where he actually ended up with a prayer group we ended up with a small group of people who actually loved God. There was no formalities. There was no sign of any kind of money, monetary reward. It was just people who got together because they loved God and praised God. And something happened. He wasn't too sure what. But he knew something had happened. He actually felt like he was in a place where he could talk to God. He said, he went together in the evening. I did not know the manners of the brethren and the joy they had in seeing poor sinners, even in any measure caring about the things of God. He made an apology for coming. But it affected him. And he became someone who started praying a lot. To make a long story short, he started off after this with a few pennies in his pocket. And he prayed. He never did any work other than praying and preaching. However, he started an orphanage. He started an orphanage, and over the period of time, at the age of 70, he had, at the age of 70, he traveled 200,000 miles going around the world and preaching, frequently to as many as 45 or 5,000 people. He continued his evangelistic works until he was nearly 90 years of age. His orphanages, without contracting debts, without committees, subscribers, memberships, but through faith in what the Lord would provide for him, he dispersed no less a sum than seven million dollars. He distributed at the time of his death, 122,000 persons had been taught in the schools supported by these funds. And about 282,000 Bibles and 1,500,000 Testaments had been distributed. 112 million religious books, pamphlets, and tracts had been circulated. Missionaries had been added in all parts of the world and no less than 10,000 orphans had been cared for by the buildings that he had erected wow. through the faith and prayers that he did. Do prayers work? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure they do. They work all the time. Let me talk to something which is very modern. You may know this man, Theo Fleury. Yes. He was a hockey player. Mm -hmm. He was a hockey player who grew up in the West, <laughs> played in many different teams, won a Stanley Cup. He became, unfortunately, much like his father, addicted to alcohol and drugs, gambling, and women. He spent at times a million dollars a night on parties. He went to the worst places in Chicago, places where nobody's sane would ever go by themselves. He went through three marriages, fortunes, all because of drugs and alcohol. And is recorded in his book. 
playing with fire, what really happened. Because he went to the point, even though he had been a famous hockey player, even though he had everything going for him, he had spent it all. He got to the point where he was trying to commit suicide. He actually had the gun in his mouth. Yes. And it was at that time that he just couldn't pull the trigger when his son called. His son he had not heard from for years. He called and asked him, Dad, how are you doing? He wasn't doing well. And he said, I was going to mess up. He didn't use that word. I'm going to mess up if I didn't do something about my behavior. So I, got, I hit my knees and said, God, please, please, please take this obsession away. He sat crying and praying for hours. This is not a prayer warrior. This is not someone who was used to praying. But he prayed for hours. I thought about being in cocaine-induced rages in the desert, talking to each, talking to cacti, yelling at God. I've had enough. I could not stop. My life was a disaster. But I went to bed and woke up the next morning feeling different. Really different. He said the obsession, the addiction, was gone. Yes, hallelujah. He had no desire to drink, to do drugs. I'm done drinking. Yes. And he has stayed free of drugs since then. Yes. An instant answer to prayer. And the last one is someone we've all, we've, some of us have read about. Irma McKinley, who was a very faithful person of Christ, who had an accident. She was caught, she slipped and fell off a staging. Her foot caught and she was held dangling by her foot upside down for a period of time. To the point that a disease called reflex sympathetic dystrophy set in, which caused her leg to become more crippled and spread up her body to her body become crippled, to her hand to becoming crippled, to her spine being twisted, twisted. She was in a wheelchair because she couldn't walk. One hand was in a club fist and she was tilted over to the side almost at 90 degrees to the rest of her body. She was racked with this. She had seen specialist after specialist after specialist. But she still never stopped praying and hoping that God would do something. She never lost her attitude towards God. This went on for a long time. One Christmas Eve, she was in her study, trying to get something off a shelf, and she couldn't reach it. So that she had to reach over further than she was supposed to reach, and she tipped her wheelchair. She fell on the floor, alone, Figured she was going to die there because she couldn't move. She was there for eight hours. When she suddenly had a vision of God being there with her, he touched her. And she got up and walked from that wheelchair to her, to her kitchen, to her bathroom. And she's been walking ever since. It's all documented. Her whole history, medical history, is documented. 
But the only thing that helped her was a touch from Christ. Amen. She was 18 years waiting for that touch. The point of this is the fact that each one of these was done in a different way. In Obergamera, one town prayed and the plague was halted. In New England, there were many people praying in different areas on that day of prayer. I mentioned one church, but the assault was halted. The two kids, this was a prayer of a child. It was very simple. God will help us. And it was answered. Yes. George Miller was a man who was not the type you'd expect to ever become a preacher or a missionary when he was young. But he was changed because of a service, mm -hmm. a small evangelistic service. And he went on through prayer to found orphanages, multiple buildings, to help thousands of children, thousands of missionaries, and teach hundreds of thousands of people, all because he kept praying. Theo Fleury was someone who was not a prayer person, but on one desperate night, when he became so much humbled to the point that he prayed, he was cured. Irma was a Christian who loved God all her life, and yet it took her 18 years through constant repetitive prayer to be healed. Does prayer work? Yes. Faith, yes. sincerity, and humbleness are the three criteria which really require one really requires to have it work. Any other way is okay. As long as you're sincere about what you say. That is a whole essence of prayer. Talking to God in a conversation between two people who love each other. And Father, I thank you for letting me give this message tonight. Yes. Mm. I thank you for allowing me to be speak. And I hope for some person it was of help. Mm. And we thank you for all your goodness and blessings that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.